amount of core. We've only got a limited amount of core and log data from the well locations, which represents a small percentage of the rock volume. So this is a challenge. These, these are the wells shown here. So why do we need a reservoir model? Well, it's, it's used to initialize this, this this, it, the desk divide function is, is used to initialize the 3D model, as shown here on the right. This tells us how the water saturation varies as a function of the height above the free water level. It tells us how the porosity in the reservoir model is split between hydrocarbon, whether it's gas or oil and water. And it tells us about the shape of the transition zone. And I'm going to into that in much more detail. A good SDRI function requires three independent sources of data to be consistent. These three sources are the formation pressure data, they're from the RFT, the electrical log data, resistivity log, et cetera, and, and importantly, the, the core data. It should be all consistent. The model should account for any varying permeability and fluid contacts, because it's very difficult to map permeability in the, in the model. The function should upscale correctly, as I'll explain. It should be convincing and easy to apply. So to tell you what the function looks like, it's called the BDW or FOIL function. And this is the, the, the equation. It's very simple. BVW is a function of height above the free water level. As simple as that. BVW, to remind you, is just a product of water saturation and porosity, or it is the percentage of water in a unit volume of rock. So the model is based upon the bulk volume of water. And as I will show you, it is independent of zonation, fascist type, porosity, permeability. Therefore, it's very simple to apply in your model. And it is only dependent upon two parameters, A and B. So let me show you a case study. This was uh, from the London Petrophysical Society. It was a uh, uh, a very difficult data set supplied from the North Sea. And it's, it's very difficult because it is very heterogeneous. As you can see, the permeabilities are varying quite a lot. The processes are varying, and we've got these tight intervals here. But, but the worst thing is, the, the problem is for the client is to explain why the water saturations increase with height. Where you would, you would expect from intuition the other way around. So the challenge was for, for many petrophysicists to go away and see who could give us the best model. And we compare the resistivity derived SW shown here in black with the function to see which has got the best match. So clearly the BVW model worked, otherwise I wouldn't be telling you about it. So the, the resistivity derived water saturation is shown in this track here is in black. And the, the uh, water saturation from the, the BVW model is shown in red. It's a very simple, which is a very good match. It's, it matches very well in the different liver fasces. Permeability is not required to derive this, or you would expect uh, permeability to be related to water saturation. So this is only defined by two parameters which represent the complete reservoir. So you might well ask, if SW can be predicted with this accuracy, do we always need resistivity logs? Now, what do I mean by that? For instance, if you drill a later well in the development in the field and the resistivity log fail with the weather the logs, would you want to go to the expense of another day rig time of a day to acquire the resistivity log if you could already match the water saturations 
from the model as accurately as this. So I want to uh, discuss important definitions to agree on the definitions for reservoir modeling. The boat on the water, the free water level, the hydrocarbon water contract, and the irreducible water saturation. Now the BBW or the bulk of water is simply the percentage of water in a unit volume of rock. Whereas water saturation is the percentage of water in the porosity. And as you know, percentages of percentages do strange things in models. Now the BBW is more important than water saturation. BVW is what is measured by the logs. The resistivity log measures the conductivity of the water depending on its salinity. It doesn't measure water saturation. In core analysis, we do not measure water saturation. We measure the amount of water displaced from the core at different pressures. If you want SW, you have got to divide by the porosity. So BVW is, is a basic measurement. Now, what is the free water level? Now, the free water level is where fluid will separate out in a wide borrow, as shown here. It is also the intersection of the pressures above and below the free water level. And notice that these are straight lines. They're not curved. So it's very clear where the contact is. Also, it is for reservoir modeling, we need to know the free water level because it's at the end of the transition zone, as I'll explain later. So the logs, the core, the pressures should be all consistent. Now we, we can trust that, just to say that the, the free water level is an horizontal surface of zero capillary pressure. Contrast that with the hydrocarbon water contact, which is at the height where the pore entry pressure is sufficient to allow hydrocarbon to start invading the, the pores. Now this will depend upon the local porosity and permeability. So therefore it is a surface of varying height. And the formation could be fully saturated for hundreds of feet above the free water level, as I will explain. So forget about the hydrocarbon water contact. For reservoir modeling, first of all, we need to know the free water level. Now let's have a look at the irreducible water saturation. The reservoir engineer often asks the petrophysicist for the irreducible water saturation. Now, I've spoken to the core analysis people, and this is the lowest water saturation that can be achieved in a core plug. And it can be achieved by flowing hydrocarbon through a sample or spinning the sample in a centrifuge. So the, the, the S to be irreducible really depends upon the dry pressure or the centrifuge speeds. It depends upon the height above the free water level. So a minimum S to be irreducible do, does not exist. It can as you as you go above the free water level to the top of the reservoir, SW will continue to reduce indefinitely. If the reservoir engineer asks us for the S to be irreducible, it doesn't exist. It's a continuous phrase. Profile is from the free water level to the top of the reservoir. It, it extends indefinitely. Now the BVW function determines SW as a function of height and porosity alone. So let's have a look at some case studies here. There were over 200 case studies there mentioned in the paper. And I want to show you one or two. This is a, a multi-well study from the Southern North Sea gas fields, right? Here we're plotting perhaps 20, 25 wells. This is the classical SW against high plot. The z-axis, the color, is porosity. We've got uh, high porosity in red, which may be aeolian dune sands. We've got fluvial sands in mid-range porosity in blue, and we've got sandy subcurrent with poorer porosities in green. And this is a kind of cross, cross lot we get. It's a, it's a shotgun pattern. Now, as what you expect 
is that from the very high process that you get an asymptotic relationship just through the good process. But as you move to the lower process, the data moves to the left, to the right, and, to, and upwards, such that at the lower process, the, the, the formation can be fully water saturated for hundreds of feet, in this case, 200 feet above the free water level. Now we need to describe this data, these data for the model. This, uh, this is uh, a, a classical SWI function. This was actually submitted to the British government for the field development plan. It says that SW is defined by these porosity bands. So you enter your porosity and your height, and in the reservoir model, it gives you the water saturation. That seems to be good, but there's a, there are problems with this plot. The, the, these are the higher process, these are the lower process. These porosity bands actually cross each other. So that is very unconvincing. Also to define these, these lines, you need data for each of the porosity bands. And you need to know where to define the end of each of these porosity bands here. This is the entry pressure or the threshold height. And this can be very difficult to define because you don't drill wells throughout the fields everywhere. So we want to describe our, this data set. We want to describe this for the reservoir modeler. And we want a very simple, convincing model. Now I'm only plotting the net data, which I will de I'll define in a little while. Now, how can we get a simple function for this shotgun pattern? Now on the next slide is going, I'm going to change water saturation to BBW, the more fundamental parameter. And this is what we get. Remind you, BBW is the percentage of water in the unit volume of rock, which is what is measured by the resistivity tools and in the core analysis. And you can see all the porosity bands collapse into a single function. So the BBW is a simple function of the height above the free water level which makes modeling very simple and convincing. Now I'm saying that the BBW is independent of rock properties, whether it's which zone you're in, which fascist type you're in, your high porosity or what permeability. How can we prove that? We can prove that with a very simple method and it's called the cross plot. You cross plot BBW against height like this, and SW against height, and you see how it changes. Now, you could, the, the, the Z axis could be the, the, the zone number or the fascist type. And if it is intermixed, then you've got, to, it is independent of that parameter. Now, let me tell you about water. This is actually key to the understanding. We all know that H2, water is H2O, which consists of two hydrogen molecules and one atom of, of oxygen. But what you may not have realized that it's got this classic shape of a boomerang. So it is predominantly positive on one side and negative on the other side. And because it's polarized like this, it, it comes very strongly attracted to itself, to other water. It's attracted because of the positive negative. And it's also attracted to the surface of the reservoir rock. And this attractive force, if you compare it with gravitation, is 10 to 36 times greater than the gravitational force. So that is why water is very important to understand in our reservoir model. <clears throat> So let's have a look at the water, the, the fluid in the reservoir. We're just going to have a simple idea of hydrocarbon and water. The water is in the reservoir first. Then the hydrocarbon migrate from the trap, from the kitchen, to buoyancy forces and start to replace the water. The water which is displaced is pushed downwards in the reservoir, down towards the free water level. However, not all the water is displaced. 
Some of it is held by these massive capillary forces, which I told you about. Now, narrow capillaries, pores with smaller throats, will have a larger surface area and will hold on to the water the strongest. Let me show you, remind you of these things you probably saw when you were at school. You've got a capillary tube, right? And the, and the water moves up the capillary and gives you this classic offset and shape, a meniscus. So it is caused obviously by the preferential wetting of the, of the, of the, of the tube, dragging up the water, okay? Or alternatively, if you put the water there, it would hold it there and it'd be immobile. Now, what you probably haven't realized is that although it pulls up the, the water inside the capillary, the movement on the outside of the capillary is even greater. That's because the surface area around the outside is slightly more than on the inside. So the result of that is that the smallest pores with the smallest pore throats hold the most water, as shown here. It will be pulled up higher in the smaller capillaries. Therefore, the hydrocarbon will require more pressure to enter the smaller pores. Yeah, I'm sorry about the red line. I don't know how to remove that. Somebody drew it on one of the slides. Okay, I'm so sorry. Well, I think that one of the participants annotated on the screen. We will try to remove it. Okay, you can continue. Thank you. Right. Yeah, it doesn't mean anything that like, okay, anyway, so th this, this is the capillary pressure equation. I don't worry about this, it's, I'm just showing it for completeness, right? And there's a simple relationship between the capillary pressure and the, uh, the capillary radius and depending on the fluid types. Now that was holding the water up. Now, gravity is actually pulling it down. And, and, and this, this force of gravity is determined by the difference between the, the water and oil density, and is called the buoyancy pressure. Very simple equation. Difference in, in, in densities tells you how much the gravity is pulling down the water. So at a given height in the reservoir, Right? There is a balance between the capillary forces holding up the immobile water, because it can't move, it's held there by these amazing forces, competing against the, the balance of the water being pulled down by the gravity. Now, the oil or gas is only allowed to go into the left over pore space, as I will explain. So cons consequently, I think in a given part of the reservoir, will contain both oil and water. Throughout the reservoir model, we've got both oil and we've got water, and the ratio, as we know, is the water saturation. Now, the capillary bound water comprises a continuous column of water within the oil leg. It's an extension of the, the hydrostatic pressure in, in, the, in the aquifer. So you've got the hydrostatic water grains here, and that actually continues throughout the, the oil or gas leg. Now, the, the oil is located in the remaining pore space, and it's, a, it's also a separate continuous phase. Now, this, is, this pressure is what you measure with the, with the, with the RFT. And it's always because it only sees the mobile phase, but still in the reservoir, you've got two pressure gradients. Now the intersection of the oil gradient with, with the water gradient, as you know, is the free water level. And these, these are straight lines in most cases. And this is because the formation pressure tester only sees the mobile phase. So the forces acting on reservoir fluids is the, is the buoyancy pressure, which increases with the height above the free water level there. And as the buoyancy pressure increases with height above the free water level, the oil phase will displace more and more from the increasingly smaller pore volumes. 
Therefore, the water saturation will tend to decrease with height. There's a short here. This is, it can, you do have exceptions to that. Now I want to tell you about fractals because it's very important to understand where this function comes from. It comes from first principles. Now fractals are very useful in reservoir modeling, as I'll explain. You see fractals on the small scale. If you're, if you're in parts of the world where you've got snow, you've got these snowflakes, which are all different. They're a fractal. They're a repeating pattern, repeating in all directions. You also see it in many, many vegetables and plants. There's a Roman cauliflower. You also see fractals on the big scale. This is a, a picture from the International Space Station of the Himalayas. And what you see is that the shapes of these major ridges is repeated in the smaller ridges all the way down. It's a repeating pattern. And this is, you also see it in river channels. This is a photograph I took when I went to uh, Basra in Iraq physically. And I, when I flew over the Delta, I could see these, these pictures. And you can see that the, the structure of the rivers are fractal, it repeats itself. Now we also see fractals on a really big scale. Now we can't get anything bigger than the cosmic microwave background, the old universe. Now, if we zoom in, we see the, the patterns are repeating. The patterns repeating it tells us that the, these, these features turn into galactic superclusters, and inside those, there was black, uh, galaxies. The universe is fractal all the way down. This picture was taken from uh, uh, Professor Brian Cox's recent book. So what are fractals again? It's a never ending pattern. There are infinitely complex patterns which look the same on every scale. And they're created by a simple repeating pattern. And maybe you, you've heard of Biwa Mangelbrot set. There is a, a very beautiful picture. It's a repeating pattern. Other names for fractals are cell similarity or scale invariance. Now, they're very useful in reservoir modeling. The parts are very similar to the old. And we see this everywhere. I want to take you an example of a tree. When you look at this tree from a distance, you see this pattern. And when, you, when you're walking closer, you see these major branches. And then this here is exactly the same as the, the tree from a distance. And the smaller branches are the same. And all the way down to the twigs, you see the same repeating pattern. And I can explain later why that is the case. But that is what we see. So many complex objects can be described by fractals, which is a very simple uh, pattern. It's a very simple way mathematically of representing complex complexity. And this includes hydrocarbon reservoirs. Now, how do we verify that something is really fractal? Let me give you this example for measuring the coastline of Great Britain. You measure anything by having a ruler. So this is Great Britain. You go around with a ruler and you measure the distance. So when you've got a very coarse ruler, you would measure the distance to be nine units. Now, if you've got a smaller uh, ruler, you go into some of the estuaries and you get a larger number for the, for, the, for the coastline of Great Britain. So smaller and smaller the ruler, bigger and bigger the coastline. So you say, well, what, how can we work out what the coastline is if it's getting bigger and bigger depending on our ruler? Well, fractals have got a very interesting property. If we plot on a long scale, right, the ruler length against the, the thing it's measuring, the, the coastline of Great Britain, it's a straight line. So as the ruler gets, gets is this the inverse, gets smaller and smaller, the, the coastline gets bigger and bigger, but on a log scale, that is a straight line. It's, a lin it's linear. And, the, and the, that is a fractal dimension. Now that is a very useful piece of information. Because when, we, when we've looked at reservoir rocks, 
many studies have looked at radio aggressive rocks and have determined them to be fractal. How did they do that? Well, for instance, if you took a, a cross section of core, you could impregnate the core with, a, with a, say, a blue dye, and then very simply get the computer to add up the number of blue pixels and divide by the outside here, and that will give you the porosity. Ah, but if you zoom in, you see smaller and smaller pores, and therefore you see more and more porosity. So you, say, you have the same problem as with the coastline. How do you know what the porosity is? It depends upon how close you get. Now, what all these studies have shown, and this is an example of Bria sandstone, if we plot the pixel size against the, the um, porosity, it's a straight line, which proves it's fractal. So that is very useful when we apply it to reservoir modeling. Now, this, is a, this slide is, is discussed in detail in the paper, but basically the fractal formula using all the, for all the way from um, snowflakes, the mountains, is, is described by this simple formula. For the reservoir, the pore space is related to the, the, the radius of the rock capillaries by this function here. And we can manipulate this as shown in the paper to give you our BVW function. And it's described in this paper here. So we need a net cutoff for our reservoir model. It's, it's, re, it's, re, it's required for upscaling our parameters. Now net reservoir is what we use in the reservoir model. It's, it's defined as a portion of rock that is capable of storing hydrocarbon. It's relatively easy to pick and is usually based on a porosity cutoff. Compare that with net pay. Net pay is a proportion of reservoir rock that can produce commercial quantities of hydrocarbon. It's often used to pick slight perforation intervals, but it's very difficult to pick. Every drop of movable hydrocarbon in the reservoir is potentially producible, depending on how hard you try, how many wells you drill, how much water injection you have, how much gas drive you have, and so on, how much stimulation you have. So net pay de really depends upon the oil price. Forget about net pay. For reservoir modeling, we, we want to look at net reservoir. <clears throat> now, what does the BBW function tell us about net reservoir? Remember, net reservoir is, the, is the, the proportion of rock that is, is capable of all these agricultural. Now, if we have a reservoir, and this represents, say, two core plugs or, or, or a zone, which is, say, 100 feet above the free water level. On the left, the rock has got an average porosity of 20 plus units, as shown here, filled with hydrocarbon and water. On the right of the reservoir, we've got only 10 porosity units of rock, but the BBW is the same in both cases. The water was in the reservoir first and it's going to stay there because of the capillary forces. The hydrocarbon can only come in and take over the porosity that the rock does have, have water. So what does this tell us? It says in, in this part of the reservoir, we've got a lot of hydrocarbon. And in this one, we've got less hydrocarbon. So in this case, the, the, uh, the net cutoff is nine porosity units, just in this example. So to remind you, the net reservoir is a rock capable of all the hydrocarbon. It's required for averaging porosity permeability and water saturation in the reservoir model. Now it varies as a function of the height of the free water level as shown here. And I will demonstrate that with the next slide. Here we've got a, a very complex reservoir with varying porosity shown in this track. And we've got a varying shaliness and porosity here. But one thing which is, doesn't vary dramatically is the white area, and that is the bulk body of water. The hydrocarbon varies depending on the porosity. The BBW is, is a, a, a function of height. So what this plot shows is that here, high up above the re reservoir, at uh, this porosity, we have got hydrocarbon in the rock and is therefore net. Whereas just above the free water level, we've, we've got the same kind of porosities, 
but the, the formation is fully water saturated. So the, the net cutoff depends upon the height above the free water level. Now, so a little bit of maths here. The BDW is a function of height and two constants. Now that's a, an exponential function. Now you remember from your high school mathematics, if we take the logarithm of both sides, this equation turns into a linear equation. Log of BBW is, the, is this. So on our plot, we're going to plot BBW against height, which is the same as capillary pressure, right? In log space. Now what I'm plotting here is six different fields, which are very different depositional environments, different types of uh, fluids. But what you see is that they're all straight lines. So each of these, to define a line, we only need, for two parameters, we only need two valid points. So even though the client has taken hundreds of points in this reservoir at a great expense, only two good points were required to define the function. The constants A and B. This, this axis here uh, is a height and it is scale invariant, which means you can change capillary pressure to height, you can change from meters to feet, and you'll get the same gradient. And that gradient is 0.42. The answer is 42. But what you also notice here is that the, the gradients are probably the same. And we're working on this now. And we find the same gradients in all fields. So your field is defined by one parameter A. So we've got this BBW function. How can we believe it? Well, well let's have a look at some core data. In this example here, we've got a core, which is shown in, in, in these red dots, blue, sorry, blue dots. We've got the uh, resistivity derived water saturation in black. And we've got um, the BBW, BBW function in red. Now this is a, a very difficult bit of reservoir because we've got very thin beds. So the resistivity log is adversely affected by the bed boundaries, the conductive shales on either side. So it is depressed. So the resistivity log is incorrect and is reading too high water saturation. And we know this is correct because the VW function is matching the core data. The core data is quality core data. It's Dean and Star. The, the wells were drilled with the oil-based mud. So there's little um, contamination. And we're just looking at um, cores above the free water level where the the rebound water is immobile. Only the center of the cores were sampled. So the Archie resistivity is too high in thin beds. So use the BB dump function and you can compare that with your core. Now this model, this BB dump function can give you a, um, an esteric function for your model, but it gives you something more profound than that. It can compare the reservoir model today, that was what from your resistivity log, which was taken say yesterday, compared to the BBW model, which is actually looking at how the, the, the reservoir was initially charged with hydrocarbon and water. So in this plot here, we've got the resistivity CPI against the BBW CPI. And you notice there's a slight difference in the water saturation. The, the resistivity log, is the resistivity from yesterday and is including the produced intervals. Whereas this is the initial conditions. So this top interval here shows you that the uh, interval has been swept. Whereas a deeper interval here, S the SW is the same, which is telling us that the hydrocarbons are, are, are still there and we need to drill wells to tap that hydrocarbon. Now, also, you must be careful the resistivity log is incorrect in thin beds and close to bed boundaries where they can, we have conductive shales, like here. The BBW function ignores thin beds, bed boundaries, and shales. 
So the function can help us pick the free water level because it's independent across the permeability. When we plot BBW against depth, right, it, it drops out to be a simple function. And even though these two wells did not uh, contact, did not uh, go through the free water level, you can predict where it is. In this case, it's showing the depth here. This is a real case study. Now we're working in BBW space, they explain. To get SW, you will just have to divide by porosity because BBW is a product of SW on porosity. So this is the relationship here. Now we get something very interesting if we actually divide by porosity our function. Instead of getting a single function like this, we get various functions for different porosities. So this is the function for 20 porosity units by dividing by 20. When we divide by 10, we get this function. And when we divide by five, we get this function. So it splits into separate s derived functions as we expect. And this tells us where the hydrocarbon water contact is. So for in this case, for at the five porosity rock, anywhere in the reservoir, it will be fully water saturated up to 200 feet above the free water level. Now depth is probably the most important measurement for the petrophysicists and for the reservoir modeling. The true vertical depth of sea can be out by up to 30 feet. This is because of survey errors and because of depth measurement errors. So it's very, it is important to have the correct true vertical sub C in your reservoir model. And you can actually normalize your wells on the free water level. If the subsurface team, the geophysicists and, and the production chemists can all agree that the wells are in the same compartment, then you can actually say they should share the same free water level. That's an horizontal plane. So it's a very easy to match, right? So in a recent case study, the wells were, were readjusted for depth. They were calibrated on the free water level and it changed the fields equity between the two companies by 3%. Now 3% doesn't sound a lot, but for a billion dollar field, that is a significant movement based upon the BBW function. Now, in my last case study, I want to show you results of many years of working on many different fields and, and, and what we have derived our understanding of this SWI function. In this, in this example here, I'm comparing uh, several fields with different, oil, uh, different uh, hydrocarbons, gas, oil, condensate, different detrital uh, structures, uh, fluvial, Aeolian, and they're different uh, geological ages. And an absolute range of, of permeabilities from two Darcy's to hardly anything, and a range of processes. The, uh, the poro perm plot is shown on the left. And as they expect, um, they follow the, the usual trend. Higher processes, the average porosity corresponds to an average higher permeability. So what do we see? Uh, by comparing these very different fields, right? Let's, co let's compare these transition zones. Remember the transition zone goes from the free water level all the way up to the top of your reservoir. There is no top otherwise. Now, if you, had a, if you were looking for an ideal field somewhere, what properties would you like to see in that field? Well, first of all, you need hydrocarbon, but you'd want an high porosity field because that high porosity gives more pore space for hydrocarbon. You'd also want high permeability so you can get extract the uh, hydrocarbon. But also, you'd want an SDI function, which is over to the left here, such so that for a fixed site in the reservoir, you've got the lowest water saturation. There's more about this in the paper. So you want a transition zone over on the left, like the gray here. Now, these, these lines do not correspond to porosity or permeability, but more to pore geometry. 
the average poor geometry in the field. Now let's have a look at these fields again. Now we're comparing the logs with the core. We're putting these on, on log log scales to make it easy to see. So we've got BBW against height above the free water level. We've got BBW from the core against capillary pressure. Remember, capillary pressure is the same as height. Now these are core plugs, which are size of matchboxes. These functions here are derived from these fields from all the, the data from the free water level to the top of the reservoir. So these are massive pieces of rock, where these are small pieces of rock. Now the, the functions are the same, irrespective of whether they determined from logs or core. Each of these lines here on the right represents a different core plug, and each of these lines on the left represents a different field. So there's just one line for each field. And what you notice is that the core derived functions are exactly the same as the, as the log derived functions. This tells us, this helps us QCR data. When you want to QC your core data, you're looking, you should have the same BBW, BBW function from the logs as the core. If not, then you maybe want to look for any fractures in your, in your core logs, or you want to look at any resistivity anomalies in your wells. So this is a great QC tool. It also confirms the fractal distribution of the pillories because it's saying you've got the same function whether you look at matchbox size core or the old reservoir. You send away to core laboratories small core plugs and they come back with an SWI function or a leverage J function from that, from that little plug. And how can you tell the reservoir modeler that you're going to represent the complete field by the results from a little core plug? Well, you can because the field is fractal in nature. So in our reservoir model, we need to upscale properties, porosity, permeability, but also water saturations. We need this to initialize our 3D model. So the, the R for measurements for the resistivity log have to be upscaled to the cell size you use in your reservoir model. For porosity, you just count the number of of process in a, in, a, in a zone and divide by the number of points and that gives you the average porosity. It's slightly more complicated for water saturation. So unlike porosity, it must be poor volume weighted. What do we mean here is that we have to multiply each of our water saturations by the porosity of that depth, divide by the total porosity and that's give you your average. So it's poor volume weighted. Now, what you notice here, it's porosity times water saturation. And what is porosity versus water saturation? It's BBW. So BBW is ideal. And as Paul Worthington said, the guru of, of uh, reservoir modeling, is that BBW is especially appropriate for upscaling. Also, the uh, model is very good for uncertainty modeling. We want to give the reservoir engineer the, uh, the most likely SUI function or the P50, but we also like to give the modeler an upside case and a downside case. Now the upside and downside can, can be done by, by incorporating the uncertainty and porosity, resistivity on these parameters. And this is explained in detail in the paper. So we, we give the modeler not just a single function, but three functions. Then they can work out the volume of hydrocarbon which is more slightly, P50, and also an upside and a downside case. So then the resident model can give to the client, the old company, not only an idea of, of the most likely hydrocarbon in their reservoir, but also an upside and a downside case, which they always ask for. And it's ideally can be done there. So in conclusion for my presentation, the, the, the BBW estimate function is derived from first principles from the fractal nature of the reservoir. It can be derived from electrical logs or from the core data by using simple linear regression on a log log plot. The logs and the core will give you the same function because it's fractal. Consequently, they, they can be used to QC each other. The function also defines the, the net reservoir cutoff 
and the shape of the transition zone, which goes on forever. And he says, S to be irreducible doesn't exist. It determines the free water level for different parts of the field. And uh, for, sorry, for the, the, the plane for the free water level and the hydrocarbon water contact at different points in the field, depending on the, the local pore open. The beauty is it is that it's it's independent of rock characteristics. You don't need a geologist. It's independent of fascist type, prostate, and permeability. Geologists can do more useful things. So you can forget about the thin beds, the bed boundary effects, and the shaliness, shaliness, and it's very easy to implement in your model because it's it's BBW is equal to is a function of height. So the last slide. The key conclusion I want to tell you about is that when you look at your core data or your log data, you plot water saturation against height or capillary pressure. Well, do that and, and just spend a few seconds to change the, the x-axis from SW to BBW and see and confirm it will, it will con collapse onto a simple function. So you forget about the water saturation, which is a percentage of percentage, and look at the measurement we, we do in the, co in the core and logs, and then think about the bulk well water. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shri, for this interesting webinar. Actually, we reach it to the maximum capacity for our session. <laughs> uh, so we have questions into the Zoom chat. Uh, the first question from engineer Samuel, how do validate the saturation height during the FDB? During the what, sorry? During the... How to validate the yes. saturation height during the FDB? The, 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 the field development plan, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very keen that we, we have three different data sets. We've got the log data, we've got the core data, we've got the pressures, right? So we, we, they, they have to be consistent. So I, I like to see quality core data where we took Dean and Star and we de derived BBW or SW from the center of the cores. And we, we want to match that with, with what we get from the, uh, the logs. And that is how we validate that we've got a good function. So core data is very important. But then again, you only need two good core plugs to derive the function. You don't need to take endless core plugs. As I showed you, they're not all in a line. Most of those core measures were, were, were not needed. <laughs> you just needed two good points to derive your, your function. And if you believe that the V value, the, the, the gradient is always uh, 42, then you, you would say that you only need to derive one parameter. A single parameter, A, completely defines your field. As Levitt J function says, the whole field looks like a single capillary if it's in communication. Okay, thank you. So the next question is saying, uh, how can we upscale core plug capillary pressure to the reservoir grid? And how can we drive an average capillary pressure for the total of the reservoir? Mm -hmm. Well, it, because it, it's fractal in, in nature, you'll find that, uh, that you'll get the same function for every plug. So you just plot your, your water saturation against capillary pressure. You just plot it SW against capillary pressure, and then you do that magic step and you change it to BBW. Now you can, then you could, have, because we've got cross plots, we can have a Z axis. And the z-axis can be a color. And that z-axis could be porosity, permeability, zone number, fascist type. And you'll find that it, it is independent of that. So, so when you look at your core plugs, forget about water saturation. It confuses it. It separates out. It, BBW will give you a very simple function. And that will, can be used in your reservoir model. OK. Uh, we have another question and the DVW very tight port. The rice cutter still and BVD, BVW versus height plot. There are scatter still. How can we define the range 
or the uncertainty of the function for the sensitivity. Right, so uh, somebody noticed uh, that there was still some scatter in the BVW function, even though when we moved from water saturation, which had a complete scatter, where BVW, it reduced, but there's still some scatter there. Now, first of all, if you can actually make your z-axis a different a parameter so it separates out, say a different zone perhaps, then you could have a different function for each zone, but we don't see that. Now, the reason why in that plot you saw a residual scatter is, is because of sampling. To, to create that plot, you needed porosity and you needed resistivity. You needed uh, resistivity for SW and the porosity. Now, the porosity has got an, a, a vertical resolution typically of one to two feet average, okay? Where the resistivity log has, has got a, 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 a 20 feet resolution, okay? So it was, the, the problem was the, the combining two different measurements uh, cause that residual scatter. But as I say, if you think the scatter could be due to a fashion style, we'll just put on your Z axis and, and prove it. On the first plot of water saturation against height, you can see the colors separated out for different porosity bands. So porosity was, an, an in the, was affecting the SVI function. So that is a way to, to, to prove it one way or the other. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, what are the factors to be considered while dealing with high salinity formation water, especially in fractured reservoir for saturation height moving? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the, the, the advantage of the, of the model is that it, it's looking at the reservoir uh, just after it finished charging. It's the, the, it's the original condition. Now this gives us a lot of advantages because um, it's telling us what it initially looked like before there was any fracturing, we, 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 before there was problems of, of different flows of, of hydrocarbon which changed the wettability. It's telling us the initial state of things before fractures, before, before wettability changes. And this is great because when we do the resistivity log, that was done yesterday. And we're comparing yesterday with tens of millions of years ago. So we, we have a differential model. And, it, and, and by comparing the two, it can tell us how the wettability has changed and how fractures have, have affected certain parts of the reservoir and not others. So it is, it is brilliant to have two things there. Okay, thank you. So we have a question. Uh, which, type, which type of quality that we are using in saturation height cooling? Which type of porosity that we are using in saturation height modeling? Effective or total porosity? Right. Uh, I've got a separate posting on, on, on porosity. I'm very keen on porosity. Uh, we've got total porosity and effective porosity. And they're very clearly defined by the uh, physicist. I won't go into those, but the bottom line is if you use total porosity with total water saturation, you'll get exactly the same amount of hydrocarbon in your reservoir model if you use effective porosity with effective water saturation. So whatever the client prefers to use, if you're consistent throughout and use a correct um, water, uh, Shelley sand equation, water saturation equation, you, you, it, this function will work. I, I've used it for, uh, uh, for, for BP, where they use effective porosity, and I've used it for Shell, where they prefer total porosity, so the, the, it's, a, it's irrelevant. But I, I, I point yourself to, to my separate paper on, on the definition of porosity. Okay, thank you. The last question that we have, <coughs> using dust and average function for saturation height modeling for all the fishes, is there a big difference or is there a big error? Uh, it's a big area in what? When you're upscaling. Uh... Okay, he is yeah. saying that if he, are, he, if he is using just one function for saturation height modeling for all the fishes, is there a big difference or it will be a big error? Mm. Using the function uh, gives you very precise um, averages. So if you've got a, a large zone, say it's 30 feet wide, 
the, the SWI function will, will vary between the top and the base. When you calculate the, the average saturation of, of the hydrocarbons, the water, it's 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 bulk volume, it, it's cross the um, weighted. So the average volumes of hydrocarbon and water are very precise if you use the function to calculate the uh, the average for the zone. There's more of it in, in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, upscaling is, is always a, a challenge because we, we measure the logs every six inches and yet the modelers are, are looking at, at tens of feet. So upscaling is very important. How we upscale probability porosity and water saturation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sri, for this interesting webinar. Uh, I think that is, is one of the best webinars that we conducted through Reservoir Solutions. Uh, and thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for your effort and time. Send me BBW plots, and I'll be happy to give you free consultancy on, on, uh, on any insights which can maximize your reserves. Yeah. Okay, thank you again, Mr. Steve, and thank you for the attendees for attending that webinar. For thank our you. today, it will be recorded, or it is already recorded, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Also, the presentation and the papers. Uh, thank you for Mr. Steve. He, he already sent to us the presentation and also the paper to be sent to the attendees. Okay, so don't worry, don't worry about that. For the certificates, uh, we sent a link for the certification. So if you want a certificate for our webinar today, you can fill in the form that was sent in our Zoom chat. Okay, we will keep the uh, the Zoom uh, or the session to be open just for five minutes. So if we uh, if we didn't uh, fill in the form, you can fill it again to get a certificate for our webinar. Thank you again for Mr. Steve and thank you for the attendees. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.